And the spirit brings us right away to our first two speakers. There are Hannah Kienzler and Barbara Preinzak. Both of them have been published and worked on a, a spotlight research paper of our foundation of the SEF. I would like to recall uh, the title again, Solidarity and Global Health Cooperation During COVID-19 and Beyond. You should have either, either seen it already online on our internet page or maybe we will see it soon here in the chat. Hannah is joining us from London and I would like to start with her. She serves as at the King's College as an associate professor in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine and, the, and as a co-director of the ESRC Center for Society and Mental Health. She has um, a strong speciali specialization and experience on health and mental health effects of complex emergencies on people living in vulnerable places. She worked on Kosovo in UK and also in Nepal, as far as I understood. Correct me if I'm wrong, Hannah. She has prepared the new SEF study together with Barbara. Barbara is joining us from Vienna, from the Vienna University. She works as a professor and head of Department of Political Science at Vienna University. She's an expert in digital practices of governance. And as we do this right now here, we understand how important that is nowadays. She's an advisor to the EU Commission on Covering Ethics of Science and New Technologies. And I would like to, and this is what I'm very much looking forward to, she will publish a new book by August with the title The Pandemic Within, Policymaking for a Better World. Barbara, we are all very curious, and I think it's a good moment to start with you and with the paper you wrote together with Hannah. Barbara, what constitutes genuine solidarity as at its core? How can your definition of solidarity be applied to the international context? That would be two of my first questions to you directly. We are discussing a lot about uh, vaccine equity, equity at the moment just yesterday. In uh, Geneva, the WHO general director um, welcomed a signal from the United States that they shall, that um, Sir Biden, the president, um, wants to give more vaccine from their um, stock to the world than foreseen until now. But I understand that vaccination is not the only um, thing you are discussing in the paper. Thank you very much, Frank. And let me add my thanks also to the Development and Peace Foundation and um, Director Stein um, for your opening words and, and everyone who has made this possible. So solidarity is probably one of the most overused terms in the crisis. And for somebody who's running a research center on solidarity, that's kind of a, a painful observation to make that suddenly um, lots of people say, and there's some, some, some deep, sad truth in that, that in the beginning of the crisis, everyone was told to be solidaristic. There were lots of um, statements made that we are all in the same boat um, and that there's an obligation on every and each one of us to be solidaristic. And then what a lot of people saw in the crisis was that whereas people and especially frontline communities um, accepted a lot of restrictions, um, exposed themselves to risks, bore a lot of the costs. What people saw at the national level and also at the international level was actually the lack of solidarity. So I think we are really at a critical point where solidarity is becoming a bad word because people feel that um, those that are already carrying a lot of the burdens across um, societies and also within societies are constantly being asked for more under the remit of solidarity, under the label of solidarity, when what we see also in, in um, a global health cooperation is, is very often just a very tokenistic um, and symbolic notion of solidarity that, as Hannah and I argue in our spotlight, is, is, is also harmful to the development of genuine instances of solidarity. So it's not merely a semantic issue. It's actually one that has real policy re relevance. And I will, I will um, end by, by outlining very briefly what also building on our previous work, um, we think sets apart solidarity from other pro-social things, 
from other pro-social practices. So the key thing in solidarity is really not only that actors, the actors could be individuals, could be states, support each other, but it's based, the support is, is in, as opposed to charity, not based on the idea that the idea of, or the notion of difference, I'm rich, you're poor, or the other way around, this is why you give me or I give you, but it's actually based on, um, on a symmetry, on the recognition that something connects these actors amidst all the differences that also exist. So what gives rise to action with solidarity is that we recognize each other as, as, as people, actors, countries that we have something in common with. So it's actually a, an, an act, a practice at eye level and not a practice that um, is enacted top down. And this, and, and, and uh, I think this is what we try to, um, to um, articulate also in our policy brief. When we look at what's currently happening through this lens, we see that a lot of what is happening, especially in the international domain, does not deserve the term solidarity. Various, uh, there was a lot of talk about solidarity already at the beginning of uh, this pandemic, uh, beginning of last year. In March, uh, the WHO announced a global uh, pandemic finally. Um, and right away, uh, it was clear that this can be over only when it's over in the whole world. Therefore, I'd like to come to you, Hannah. Um, what's your assessment until now when it comes to the international community in general? and the EU in particular, concerning their actions until today. Yeah, thank you very much, Frank. Um, my assessment is not very positive, I have to say. And Barbara and I, through writing this piece, actually looked for positive examples of solidarity in, in the international arena and in the global arena. And it was very hard to find. So what COVID-19 has hyper-visualized, I believe, is existing global inequalities across a variety of axes of race, gender, class, disability, within and between countries. As Barbara already said, the kind of rhetoric of we're all in the same boat fell flat on its face um, as inequalities widened. And, and we're seeing it, it's a mirror, the pandemic is a mirror of a situation that existed obviously before the pandemic that, that exposed people in different ways to different risks um, with different access to um, medical care and social support. Of course, we are now seeing the types of vaccine sharing, but also that we are quite critical about. It's, uh, it's often more charity than solidarity in that global the countries in the global north are sharing their leftover vaccines in a generous act um, however the fact that they have additional vaccines vaccines to give is because they pre-ordered in in huge quantities i mean being able to vaccinate their population several times over with the us for example um pre-ordering you know one billion extra doses, completely obscene when you look at the global situation. COVAX, of course, tried to step in. COVAX, the um, COVID-19 vaccine global access initiative by WHO, trying to create equitable access um, between countries. However, here, also here, countries in the global north have um, struck first in that they pre-ordered their vaccines from the suppliers, um, which then knocked basically COVAX to the back of the, of the purchasing chain. And again, is very much dependent on the generosity of countries in the global north, yeah. which means that countries in the global south face extreme challenges to develop their own sustainable health response in, in the midst of, of the COVID pandemic. And it seems that it doesn't get better at the moment. I just would like to mention that UNICEF just published a couple of days ago research that uh, these world regions, talking about the United States, the European Union, including this point, the United Kingdom, um, could give out about 
20% of this production of vaccines to COVAX and still meet their vaccination goals. Why is that the case when before everybody was talking about solidarity? Barbara, would you like to take this? Well, I think um, as, as Hannah already said, um, and as uh, Director Stein also said, um, we are certainly not um, not uh, here to criticize COVAX. We believe that COVAX is a fantastic um, initiative, but the way that COVAX is embedded in the political economy exposes some of the other mechanisms that, as Hannah was saying, through bilateral um, negotiations, through bilateral purchasing agreements, um, due to the lack of price transparency, um, those that are already at, at the bottom of the pyramid in terms of resources and power are being pushed further down. And um, I think if we then use a rhetoric of solidarity, we are concealing the power differentials that still consist, that still persist, rather than really focusing our, our gaze and our action to the mechanisms that can ensure that the political economy within which um, initiatives such as COVAX are embedded in, ensure that there's um, greater equity. And creating this greater equity will hurt. So this is also one aspect of solidarity, that um, solidarity is not merely clapping your hands and smiling, but solidarity does take some cost for those who are enacting solidarity in a different point of time, um, which, however, doesn't preclude that at a later moment in time, um, somebody also benefits. But this idea of, of personal benefit can't be the motivating factor. So this is what the notion of indirect reciprocity means. We are doing something now that might um, actually have some cost for us, um, eventually, we might also benefit in the future, but the idea that we benefit um, and the, the, the orientation towards this immediate benefit cannot be the main motivation. If it is, it's a business transaction. It's not solidarity. Do you have, um, when you were writing your paper, could you, I think it's a good thing to uh, talk about lessons learned while such a process is ongoing. Do you have any concrete recommendations based on the experience of the last few months now already? Yeah, I, I suppose there are recommendations to make and they're varied. So one of the key elements um, that we're also touching on in the paper is, is the kind of knowledge exchange. And just to build up on what Barbara was just saying, when we think about reciprocity, a give and take, it's not necessary that we give or take the same sort of substances. So we may invest um, resources, money, know-how, but then in exchange, we could receive knowledge, which we completely missed at the beginning of the pandemic, where we failed to actually learn from others, countries in the global South, countries um, that are considered low and middle income countries with huge experience in pandemic preparedness. So in terms of lessons learned, I suppose besides a medical gaze, besides a medical understanding of the pandemic, we need to work on understanding the pandemic through a sociological gaze, through seeking for political answers, economic answers, besides um, conducting medical research and focusing on sort of technical advances. We need to double down on current social structures. So the COVID-19 pandemic has shown that our inaction has, is bringing us not quite to our knees, but is, is quite challenging. And what is required, and this is one of the key notions that we're talking about, is encounters from a position of equality so that we meet each other as equals in this, debunking certain hierarchies that have no place when it comes to a global pandemic. Where we need to agree on is that besides tackling a virus, in order, or rather in order to tackle a virus, a pandemic, what we need to do is to reduce structural inequalities um, as a goal that should unite us, where the focus is on reducing poverty, discrimination, and resulting 
inequities. Anna, Barbara, um, is, is there maybe even more into that? I think it's a very good moment to bring in um, another uh, person on the panel. I'm so happy that uh, John Amuyazi is joining us from Kumasi in Ghana, from the Kumasi Center for Collaborative Research. Great to have you with us, John. Um, you are leading the Global Health and Infectious Diseases Research Group. And I myself, as a journalist, was following intensely uh, the developments of the pandemic in Africa. And I, can, and I very much can uh, recall until today how everybody was in the European Union saying, oh, my goodness, what is going to happen in Africa when SARS-CoV-2 is emerging there? However, we have learned that many, in particular Western African countries, have, have dealt quite, quite good and positively with the pandemic. Um, What is, there to, what is there to learn for us from your experience, in particular um, concerning non-pharmaceutical interventions and, and educating people, for example? You probably see the pictures uh, even from Germany and other places in Europe where people are protesting uh, against non-pharmaceutical measures. This is something I haven't seen, at least in, not from, from Western African countries. There must be something you do much better than we here, right? Oh, thanks, Frank, and um, uh, good uh, afternoon there um, to, to everyone, and it's a pleasure to be with you, um, and thank you also to the previous speakers, um, uh, Barbara and, and Hannah. I think you made some really, really critical points, and uh, I think, Hannah, the, the last point you made uh, really struck me, um, and I'll come to your substantive uh, question, Frank, but this whole concept of structural inequalities and Uh, for those of you who are uh, more into academia, familiar with the uh, Link and Felon's fundamental cause theory, which really speaks to what you were um, talking about, Barbara and uh, Hannah, uh, regarding why we will still continue to have these pandemics and why there will be a disproportion, uh, not only in the suffering from the pandemic, but also the capacity uh, to respond and the lack of active solidarity, uh, which is being manifested uh, currently with this pandemic, although there's been a lot of lip service before, and, and now we're seeing different things. More substantially, Frank, to, to your question about um, the non-pharmaceutical measures and how they may have contributed to what we're seeing uh, so far in Africa, I think the, the multiple arguments, and uh, at this stage, we have a lot more um, information to debunk um, some of the theories or the thoughts, but we do not have enough to actually nail down and say, this is it, this is the game changer. Of course, this is why sometimes people don't like uh, the academics so much. We're so good at saying what doesn't work, but not, not, not very good at saying what actually does work. Uh, not with, notwithstanding, um, the non physical measures, um, we know uh, from a public health and from a population level perspective at uh, what really makes the, the difference uh, to, to most communicable diseases or infectious diseases. I can take you back to Ebola in West Africa. And, you know, while the vaccine trials and, uh, you know, convalescent plasma trials and all those did come to Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone that bore the brunt of the Ebola crisis in West Africa. Uh, the truth remains that the, the pandemic, uh, well, the West African pandemic was in decline uh, at the time when all these measures came into place. So it is very clear that it wasn't so much all the fancy things that we started doing, including the ring vaccination trials, but it was more that realization from the population, albeit via education, that, um, you know, the, the, the water sanitation and hygiene issues, infection prevention control in facilities and so on, in ETUs, in homes, was what was going to make the difference. And it sure did make the difference. Of course, with um, SARS-CoV-2, it's a little different because it spreads a lot faster, more easily. Uh, actually, it's more, less deadly than Ebola, but it does spread much faster. And so the threshold at which your infection prevention control, the water sanitation and hygiene will really take effect is very high. So you really need to achieve a pretty high level of these things. Now, the question is, in sub-Saharan Africa, these levels of infection prevention control, social distancing, enforcing lockdowns, you know, we did lockdowns and all that, but um, the evidence on the ground suggests that while these lockdowns were helpful, 
they were not really what made the difference. And these lockdowns were lifted anyway. And these lockdowns were lifted and the numbers went higher than they were before the lockdown. And they didn't go any higher. So for me, there's enough evidence that it's not necessarily the lockdown. Um, and of course, the infection prevention control hygiene issues could have played a significant role um, in all this. Um, but and then you want to think about it also in many countries in Africa, West Africa in particular, but also the whole of Africa, temperature scanning and hand wash and alcohol, alcohol hand rubs are ubiquitous in the airports. These things stayed after Ebola through and even into um, uh, into COVID. They could, they could have contributed in a way. But for me, where the rubber hits the road is this, and Frank, I'll just wrap up because I know this time constraint. If you look at the current evidence for um, of seroprevalence of, of SARS -CoV, of, of COVID up without SARS CoV 2 in many African cities, um, it's pretty high. Um, you know, off the record estimates from Mali, a colleague of mine showed me, are looking at close to 60% seroprevalence in some cities. Uh, my group just completed some work in, in Kumasi, which is where I sit. And we're looking at close to 40% zero prevalence. And this is across age groups and across social strata, including people with tertiary education. Now, what this tells you is that, and, and, and if you compare with the zero prevalence in Europe and North America, it, it seems to be even lower in Europe and North America. And yet there's much less severe disease, much less hospitalization. So for me, the theory that um, West Africa or Africa practice very solid infection prevention control Yes, it, 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 is, it is plausible, but this, I don't think, really made the difference because the evidence from serial prevalence shows that it actually spread a lot. So for me, it is clear that um, we, we're just getting sick less and uh, getting hospitalized less and, and certainly, certainly by any measure, dying less. This is very clear because you cannot hide death. Death will be in your face. You cannot fix that one. Yeah. So with, with all that, it tells you there's all things we still do not understand. And of course, in my next comments, I'll speak more to the solidarity issues uh, where I have some, some strong comments to make. As John, John we, will, we, we have to come back to this. But for now, I would like to bring also in Jan Peter from the EU Commission. Jan, you serve as a deputy head of unit for social inclusion and protection, health and demography with DG International Partnerships. Let me ask you a little bit provocative. Obviously, in African countries, things have been better understood than here in the European Union. John just mentioned that a regular measurement of, of fever, of temperature, is something people are used to. People here were not used to, uh, even not by uh, last summer or, or autumn. Why is that the case? Why are we so arrogant here in Europe? Um, well, I don't think it has to do with uh, being European, um, but uh, I think the challenge you describe is uh, absolutely uh, relevant. How do we accept scientific knowledge uh, in, uh, in, 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 in shaping our, our behaviors? And scientific think, knowledge from Africa, yeah. Ah, from yeah, from Africa, yeah, but we we don't even accept it if we if it comes from our own uh, scientists. Everybody knows we have a leading scientists in our country, and they advise the government. And you can all reflect yourself how much the government is uh, actually following the science, uh, which in Europe in particular hasn't been the case. In the US, even less. So, um, but uh, from from the perspective of, of of Africa, yes, we have uh, taken into account, for example, the use of the the vaccine and like john has said when in west africa we saw the decline um, it was before the vaccine actually came uh, the ebola vaccine but it helped kill it off and um, regarding um, the um, um, lack of, of 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 impact or softer impact that the epidemic seems to have had uh, on africa um, there was indeed um, a surprise in the beginning there was thinking um, uh, well maybe we don't have the data maybe we don't see it. Um, but it now, as John uh, is, is saying and demonstrating scientifically uh, valid data, uh, this se doesn't seem to be the case. So there must be a different um, uh, way. And whether it's uh, medical, whether it's behavior, whether it's demographic, um, we will we will have to to learn, and that will have to um, come into the into the next um, uh, planning for the next uh, response. But I. Um, I I accept uh, the fact um, that um, 
um, uh, we, we need to get a lot better in uh, liaising with uh, uh, or bringing together scientists from Europe and from uh, from Africa or actually around the world to uh, to to know more for the collective good. Thank you, Jan. John, I would like to give you um, the word now. You, I think we, we're all talking about this huge word of solidarity here, um, as presented by our two authors as well are the most important. What is, what is really important when, when it comes to the definition of solidarity here? John. No, so thanks for that, Frank. Um, and again, once again, to, to Hannah and Barbara for the great work done. Um, as you know, solidarity in itself is a, it's a technical term. Uh, of course, it's used um, you know, very uh, casually. Uh, to represent, you know, standing with or, you know, supporting, being supportive of, uh, of another situation which you may share. Um, and, uh, you know, the whole um, concept of, or, or, you know, democracy and the Western world is, is built around solidarity, the strength of the EU, um, even with the exit of the UK, or shall I say the exit of the UK from the EU, uh, really... Um, sort of brought to the fore this whole argument about solidarity and how that that has essentially led to building a strong Europe and thinking that uh, the Brexit was really a sign of lack of solidarity uh, of, of the UK with the rest of the European Union. Um, so, so it is clear that solidarity has a way of spreading the risk, spreading the burden uh, for the collective um, good. Uh, of course, the, you'd realize that some countries have, well, all countries have benefited in one way or the other or lost in one way or the other on account of solidarity. But what you want to do is to aggregate all that up and see whether the benefits for everybody do outweigh whatever the losses may be. And I think this is what your experience has been in Europe too, to a large extent, although, of course, this is now being called into, into question in, in many places uh, with the very strong Uh, you know, populist uh, kind of movements. Um, but that notwithstanding, uh, when it comes to global solidarity, particularly in, in the area of health and, and so-called development, uh, we've had a lot of uh, positive vibes from um, Europe and from North America, from the global West, uh, which espouse these as really what should be done. This is why you have the, the, the UK FCDO, you have uh, the various German foundations and uh, the USAIDs and the CEDAS and all these others, which really are the epitome of the solidarity of these governments with, um, with Africa. But now when, when, when the problem is presented where the real solidarity must come in, because the solidarity is where we share a common problem with standing with each other. Otherwise, it becomes charity, as uh, Hannah and Barbara very elegantly put it. Now, when the problem is shared, the eyes are all turned inward. And for me, where it, it gets most disturbing is to see um, countries which have been uh, bastardized, if I would say, for not showing global solidarity. And of course, it is clear for many actions that they have not done this in many fronts, not only in health, uh, you know, like Russia and China and others. It is, it is disturbing to see when you analyze very critically the, the true level of, let's call it what it is, charity, that has been demonstrated, let alone solidarity in this time with regard to you know, the provision of vaccines, engaging with African countries and uh, looking to see what can be done. Uh, I would argue that there may have been maybe more done by these countries than the traditional partners who have, you know, forwarded this whole idea of, of solidarity. Of course, it's easy for me to criticize. I know it's more complicated than that. Um, but um, definitely an issue uh, for which... Uh, we need to discuss very dispassionately and very openly, try to look at what the bottlenecks are in the talk and how we are unable to translate this into the real walk, knowing very well that these others that seem to be doing it really have their own interests at stake and it's not real solidarity. I can say this quite openly. Uh, but these are things we need to really stay in the face and, and, and address very clearly. Th thank you very much, John. Um, looking at the clock, I would like to give Jan the chance to respond to what you've just said. Um, Jan, in the light of your experience, how do you assess the performance of the international community until now? 
Yeah, well, uh, well, I work for the European Union, so I think the need to differentiate uh, international, do we say the European or the, uh, the, the the global? And I think in the in the EU, we have come a long way of uh, working together and showing solidarity and uh, looking at this together, um, while also not forgetting the the global dimension. If you look back uh, a year ago or one and a half years ago, when the when the um, pandemic broke, uh, several uh, EU members states in act of solidarity sent uh, personal protective equipment to China uh, because uh, the, 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 the pandemic erupted in the, in the area where most of these products are, are being produced. Um, but uh, when, when the pandemic then came to Europe, uh, several member states blocked exports to Italy, which was a very painful uh, moment, I must uh, say, for European uh, solidarity. But this has created a wake-up call for the EU member states to come together and try something unprecedented, namely to procure um, the vaccines, uh, first masks and then the, the, the vaccines uh, together. So the, the EU had no competence, no experience in, in this before, and yet in, in a very short time pulled off um, a, a massive uh, joint procurement scheme uh, for, for the EU. And with all the criticism uh, you will see now that uh, when you read the papers, there's a uniform uh, coverage of, of vaccination rollout now in the EU. At the same time, it was clear um, we, we have to uh, ramp up global production huh? and the shortage is still real. We need 11 billion doses of vaccines to vaccine, uh, vaccinate the world. We have now produced globally 1.5. So however we distribute the vaccines, we have a massive shortfall. So, but this this, why we have come to 1.5 billion is a real miracle, is thanks to the ramping up production in the EU. And the EU from the start created the production capacity to produce for the world. The other major producers, uh, particularly the US, uh, the, but the UK, have not exported uh, a single dose. So while the EU is, is, is exporting, it's not their, our doses, it's the doses that are produced in the EU, but they are not given away for charity they are marketed uh, across the world um, and uh, about half of the, 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 the products pr um, produced in the EU are exported, uh, the vaccines. So, and, and then the EU has, has created this COVAX facility because we saw it is important to have a joint procurement mechanism. And that came up to a wonderful start uh, as well, but is now hampered by the by the global supply problems, and particularly because relying on a major producer for India, who is now not exporting but using the vaccines for for India, which as an act of solidarity we understand because that's where it's currently most needed. So it's so I think. From, uh, the, from the EU perspective, international collaboration has really uh, shown solidarity at the, at the EU context, and we're not giving up on the, on the global sphere, that's for sure. Jan and John, before we open the floor, we have many questions already in the chat. Um, very briefly, Barbara, Hannah, would you like to comment briefly on what you just heard from John and Jan? Yeah, I, I wouldn't mind to comment, and thank you, John and Jan, for your responses and also thinking with our paper. What I would like to do is to push a bit back on the sort of technical interventions because we're talking about COVID, um, but COVID will, is just one pandemic amongst pandemics that we will be facing in the future. So focusing on technical solutions such as a vaccine is not good enough. It is important. It is important for the short term to get this pandemic in check. However, if we're thinking globally and possible new pandemics and outbreaks of other kinds, I do believe what we need is, is a solid public health approach. And with a solid public health approach here, also thinking globally, I think it needs to come go hand in hand, um, needs to be fueled by solidarity, the kind of solidarity that Barbara and I was are talking about, so not the feel-good one, the fuzzy one. But combine social justice, so a distribution of wealth, opportunities, privileges in an equitable manner, distributive justice, so that, um, yeah, that that so, uh, that goods are justly, resources are fairly allocated globally. But then also, I think we need to look back in history because 
these kind of global inequalities, they have not come from nowhere. And I do believe we need something like reparative justice because in the West, we have extracted, extracted resources and extracted knowledge to build our own economies and our possibilities to actually act as effectively as we do in terms of developing vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a view for me into the future that a sole focus on technical intervention is not good enough going forward. It has to be driven, as I said, by solidarity social justice, distributive justice, but also reparations paid. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, we have uh, quite a few questions. Can I, can, I, can I add something? Sure. Sorry, excuse me, Baba. Um, I would like to add something very briefly to un, un, partly to underline things that Hannah said and partly to um, say that from my perspective, it's technical solutions and the foundation underneath that are needed at the moment. So what, if we look at, this is true for many countries and also globally, um, if, if we look at the one um, factor that was the biggest risk factor for COVID, it's actually poverty. And this is something that all the countries in the world have in common. Of course, the, the, the extents are different and the consequences of poverty are different, but the fact that this is a medical and a social risk factor. So then poverty reduction um, needs to be something that, and this is something again that we can all have in common, needs to be the, the, the one of the main concerns with in addition to um, the reduction of, of social inequalities. And I think Hannah mentioned um, um, reparative justice already, part of such a reparative justice approach could be debt cancellation. And here, I think um, the, the um, foundation's uh, latest uh, policy brief um, actually speaks to some very important issues here that we don't have time today to go into, but yeah. that would be part of, a, of, of such a solution. Mm -hmm.